Hello and welcome to the Sports Show Podcast, your bite-sized guide to enter the sports industry. Joining me, as always, in the studio is the big Tomahawk, Ruben Williams. How are you, mate? G'day, Ryan. I'm fantastic. Thank you very much. Where did you get Tomahawk from? I'm a bit curious about this one. Well, when I worked at the Mighty Hale Hockey Club behind the bar once upon a time, I got to learn a bit about hockey. Yep. And a Tomahawk is like a backhanded shot. Okay. That is pretty rare. But, you know, only select few players can really do it well. And I just remember always thinking, like, come on, just do a tomahawk. Come on. Just <laughs> Give us absolutely a... swing at it. Show us the tomahawk. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, so, yeah, I thought it's fitting for today. It's kind of one of my vivid memories of my time in hockey. Nice. I didn't know you had a background in hockey, but that's, <laughs> that's excellent to learn about. Uh, I'm sure David, our guest today, will be very proud too. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I think I mentioned it briefly before we uh, got onto air, so <laughs> it's good to share that. <laughs> anyway, let's get cracking. Let's do it. Um, if you want to learn more about us and, and what we're up to or want to ask us any questions at all, connect with us on LinkedIn or jump into the Sports Rad community. Uh, there's plenty of people in there, none other than uh, Hockey Australia. Yes, uh, and be sure to ask Ryan about his hockey career as well while you're reaching <laughs> out to us too. But a quick shout-out to our community members. It is going off in there. We've passed 300 members, which is fantastic. Mm. Uh, and Hockey Australia have got on board as well. They've got some people inside there to help develop their staff and then also recruit future staff as well. So we uh, we thought what a time to get David in, the CEO of Hockey mm. Australia, to, to talk about what they're up to. But uh, if you're listening to this and you're thinking about getting your foot in the door of the sports industry or if you are part of an organisation and you're looking to hire qu- hire people quickly and easily, like Hockey Australia, uh, there really is something for everyone inside the sports grad community. So be sure to get involved with that. Absolutely, Rubes. As usual, a quick message from our great friends at Deakin University. If you're currently studying or you've just finishing studying, having a postgrad qualification in sports management on your resume can give you a huge leg up over other potential candidates. Just ask Ruben Williams here who has exactly that on his resume. Great organisation. That's how he's been so great over the last few years and nailed, well, got into cricket. So absolute superstar. So if you want to ju- if you want to pump up your resume and get specialised knowledge in pretty much every area of sports, check out Deakin's postgrad qualifications. Their Master of Business in Sports Management is not one of, but the best one in Australia, ranked at number one. So at a postgrad today, and that's our tip for the episode. Now, Ryan, this guy who we're chatting with is actually worth pumping up. I'm talking about <laughs> David Pryles, of course, the CEO of Hockey Australia. Now, David, his career dates back to investment banking. He came out of an economics degree, moved into the investment banking world, but always wanted to transfer it to sport. And he was able to do so extremely effectively and has done it across a number of different sports. He moved into commercial sales manager at Cricket Victoria. He then became the head of commercial at the Melbourne City Football Club uh, before going into golf as the uh, commercial director of the Players Golf Association, the PGA of Australia had a role in that with the European tour as well before making the jump into CEO of another national body, Softball Australia, which included uh, seeing them through the Tokyo 2021 Olympics. And now finally, he's just stepped into the role as CEO of Hockey Australia at an incredible time to do so. The Com Games are coming out. The Olympics are soon after that. A future home Com Games has just been announced as well. And there's a future home Olympics after that. So it is an incredible time to be stepping into the role of CEO at a national sporting organisation in Australia. Absolutely. And uh, I believe the first NSO CEO we've had on the Sports Show podcast. So it's a, a monumentous day, uh, which is great. Um, what are some quick things to, to look for in this episode? Well, if you're listening to this and thinking, I'd love David's job one day, David starts by talking us straight through the interview Mm. process. Everything he got asked, everything, every task he had to complete, how the whole process works because you hear a lot about, you know, stock standard job application processes but you never really understand what goes on at the senior level. What do you have to be prepared for if you want to be a CEO? So it was really good to uncover what David went through to get his job. Yeah, totally. I I loved how he spoke us through how to create a six to 12 month plan for when you do get in that seat, he, you know, he mentioned part of the interview process was touching on that. But then 
he actually went into sort of how you actually come up with that plan, which is, you know, if anyone's stepping into, you know, Hockey Australia, it's like, well, where do you start? So David talks us through that, which is great. Absolutely. And then we mentioned the uh, plethora of events coming up. There's Com Games in Birmingham this year. There's mm. Com Games coming to Victoria in 2026. Uh, there's Olympics in Paris after that. There's a home Olympics in Brisbane. Uh, and hockey is going to feature at every single one of those events. So David talks to us about what Hockey Australia's plans are for each of those, what, co- what kind of plans they have in place to build up to the future events and the legacy that they want to create through participation and other different functions as well during that period. So an incredibly exciting chat. Very you good. You mentioned the first national body CEO we've had on and it, uh, it lived up to that, right? I thought. Yeah, absolutely. Got to love it. Well, we won't wait any longer. Grab a pen, enjoy this chat with David Priles. David, welcome to the Sports Grab podcast. Thanks, gents. Good to be here. David, we saw you uh, floating around on TV the other day and you popped up on, on Channel 10. What were you doing on uh, on the breakfast TV? <laughs> Thanks to the vice, uh, our <laughs> vice president, Sandra Sully. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, obviously, the Commonwealth Games were announced for Victoria, so um, hockey's a, lot, a big part of it. Um, we've got a great, great history in, in the in the sport. So, uh, doing a little bit for hockey. <laughs> um, we're playing in Geelong, which is great. Uh, mm. So, yeah, home home Com Games, home Olympic Games in the next ten years is going to be really exciting. Amazing, well, exciting news, and uh, very handy having Sandra Sully on the on the hockey team as well. When you've got big yeah. announcements to share too, really engaged too. <laughs> She's been on the board for seven years. So really, okay. as a CEO, you love your board members being engaged and passionate, which is what she is. So, yeah, it's great, fantastic. Oh. Well, you you've just joined hockey like a perfect time. You've got Commonwealth Games coming up this year, home Commonwealth Games coming up in four years' time. Um, tell us about what it's like coming into a brand new sport as a CEO. You've been in the job three four months now. What do you do to get started? Yeah, really good question. I was fortunate in that I had to give three months notice from my previous role. So it, it took some time to, to build, it takes time to build a relationship. So I started doing that from October last year before I started in, in, in January. It's really important as a new CEO that you build a rapport with all your stakeholders and there are plenty of stakeholders within an NSO environment. Um, that is obviously including your states. So they're, they're, they're your biggest stakeholders because you can't get anything done without their support. Mm. So to build with the presidents and, and their boards and the CEOs is, is, is hugely important. Um, coming from another NSO, ha- having had the relationships I've got with the AOC and Sport Australia and AIS does help. Um, but then you're building stakeholders and, and it's not, not building stakeholders, but you're building rapport with people within the sport. So they may not necessarily be on a board, but there might still be influential past mm. players past administrators, it's really important to get the lay of the land and understand from their perspective. There's the, the likes of Jamie Dwyer, so to speak? Yeah, Jamie Dwyer. I mean, there's, there's even people with, involved within our sport. Um, so full-time in, in, a, in a pathways development role is, is Mark Knowles, who Knowles, he, uh, held the Aussie flag for a Commonwealth Games um, opening ceremony, and uh, he's fantastic. But other people, like a David Wandsborough, for instance, who's not intrinsically involved in the national body or state body, he's involved at Camel Hockey Club. Um, and other people who have been on the board p- previous who are who are sort of past now but can give you a, a little bit of a history on the sport. Nice. So, nice. so talk us through that kind of transition period. Like um, you had to give three months' notice from your old role as CEO of Softball Australia. When did, the, uh, the, uh, when did you start thinking about the role at hockey or when did they start thinking about you? How did that transition work? Yeah, really good question. They Obviously hockey's gone through a fair bit of change based on the cultural review that happened within the female program at the start of last year. Um, and, and the previous CEO had moved on and they went to market in about uh, about August. I remember it was during lockdown and, and we were down the coast and I had a look at it and I said to my wife, I'm only going to go for this if I know I can make a difference. And, uh, and she said, yeah, put your hat in the ring. And one thing I did do was engage with um, someone external, so someone who uh, had taken the executive leadership team at Softball Australia through a strategy day. So I gave her a call and said, can you help me through this process? I'd never, ever mm. sought support before. Um, she was fantastic. So that's a little bit of advice I would give is if you're going for a job and you really, really want it, spend a little bit of money, 
um, on someone external to help you through the process, right? So that's what I did. And uh, this is going to sound really cheap, but <laughs> I didn't have anything down the um, down the holiday house. So I went on the iconic.com.au. There's a, there's, a, there's a small little plug for a new sponsor. Yeah. <laughs> Got myself a shirt and a jacket because everything was going to be on, on Zoom. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, – uh, I had enough jackets at home, so what I did was I actually kept the, uh, the tag on the jacket and sent that back <laughs> after the first two interviews and, really? and off we go. <laughs> that is a great yeah. story. <laughs> and, and, and then what, what happens in a CEO interview? Yeah, it's um, – so firstly, they're going through a, a, a effectively a recruitment consultant or a headhunter, um, and that's who – firstly, you pick up the phone and you have a chat. You find out a little bit more, get your name known, and then – spend some time putting together an application. That's where the support helps and then and then put it in. And then they uh, they gave me a call and, and I spent oh, over an hour on the phone with just them prodding. So it was effectively mm. like a first interview. Mm. What they were doing was putting together a list to present to the short to, – to, to present to the committee at Hockey Australia yeah. on these are the people we've talked to, these are their skill sets. So you really need to make a good first impression. Hockey Australia said, yep. We'd like to interview these people. Fortunate enough, I was one of those eight people. I think they, I think it was eight people that they said yes. First interview. So they put together a, a sort of a subcommittee. So it's the two consultants, uh, two board members from Hockey Australia and someone from the AIS. So you get through that and they say, yep, they'll take you to the next stage. Great. So then I had to do psychometric testing. So if anyone has done psychometric <laughs> testing before, yeah. it's online. So their time. So there was there was four tests. Um, part, somehow passed that. Um, <laughs> got through and had to put a get put together a presentation on effectively my first twelve months or first six months and then twelve months in the role and and how I would go about doing that. So I presented that then to the to the same subcommittee, and then got through that, and then the final stage was presenting to the whole board which was on the Friday morning of the grand final holiday, long weekend. So I did that and then for the rest of the time till probably Monday afternoon, as my wife would say, I was an absolute shit, <laughs> which I was because I was so nervous because you, you're that far but you can't control it after that. You've yeah. you put your best foot forward and I knew I'd put my best foot forward and <laughs> and then uh, I got a phone call on the Monday afternoon and said and so, uh, basically from the recruitment consultant saying um, you're the preferred candidate and I said, well, that's the best phone call I've received in three years. <laughs> wow. So yeah, so it was a lengthy process but you're safe in the knowledge that as an, it's, it's an organisation you want to join because they're mm. very thorough. Um, I'm really also proud to join an organisation that will enforce a working with children's check, enforces a mm. police check. So we do that for all our staff now too. Mm. With interviewing for a CEO role, how different is your preparation or the, the things you work through in your head? How is that different to a role that you've been to, been going for before? Like I'd imagine the principles are still relatively the same. Yeah, they are. Um, I mean, I, it, it's a little bit similar. Um, the role before I had that was a commercial director in golf, so PGA of Australia on the European tour. And it's always involved with a presentation. So yeah. it's all well and good to tell someone that, oh, you're good enough and you can do this and that. But even from a hiring perspective, you want to actually see it on paper and someone presenting. So any role, mm. you know, ever since the golf role and, and the two CEO roles I'm in now, any role that I'm looking at, at bringing on, I want to see a presentation because I want to see it in practice. Tell me what you're going to do and put it in writing. So... Is that from the coordinator role all the way to your exec team? Yeah, well, I'll give you an example. So my first job in sport, I didn't come from sport. So I came from investment banking and mm. I missed out on three jobs because I didn't have sports experience. One of them so happened to be a junior sales role at PGA within five years I was too, I see. So that's a bit <laughs> of advice is never give up. Mm. Um, I had to do something different because I knew people were just submitting a CV, submitting a CV and they had sports experience so they were getting an interview. I needed to do something that was going to get me an interview because I didn't have sports experience. So I put a presentation together for my first job in sport. When they didn't ask for it? No. And it was, wow. my, and it was my transferable skills. I've still got it to this day. I've showed a, I, I showed a few people. So it was my transferable skills that I could bring from investment banking into a sales role in sport, my contacts, 
and what I could do in the first 60 days. And I submitted that with my CV. That's awesome. That do you still unreal. have that? Yeah, I do. Do you reckon we can share that? Oh, yeah, I can show you. I can show you <laughs> a little bit. Um, you can tweet it. You don't have to. <laughs> no, I'm, happy, I'm, ha- I'm happy to show it because I think – and, and I come from an aspect now of someone who employs people. Mm. If someone's going to do that and go over and above and yeah. show me that commitment, I'll give them an interview mm. Mm. because they know that the, you know that they desperately want to roll. It's a bit like when people say they're passionate in the first line of a CV mm. uh, cover letter. Sorry, yeah, everyone's passionate. You can or say you that. or you wouldn't work in yeah. sport, <laughs> yeah, like yeah. you know. Yeah. But take that out and actually show me your passion in in your, your work. Mm. Mm. That's wow. awesome. I love that initiative there. Um, I want to dive into the more recent presentation that you did for the first six to 12 months of your role as CEO at Hockey Australia. Yep. What, what did you include on your, in your outline there? What was your kind of focus across the, the year? Yeah, the focus, the focus was primarily on building stakeholder relationships because you're never going to get anything done in an organisation if you don't have everyone on, everyone on the same side, especially in a federated model like most sports are. Mm. So that was a key pillar in what I was going to do. The other one was commerciality. So uh, the Hockey Roos program had lost Ausdrill's major partner in, or well, were going to lose them you know, in, in December. And we knew that there were some cuts coming from the AIS. So commercial revenue, and most NSOs are like this, there's an unhealthy reliance on, on um, government revenue. So that was going to be a key pillar and that's what I knew could get me over the line because that that's the commercial experience I'd had in the past. So I focused on that um, as well as the recommendations from the independent review, which is clearly still going on and it is still going on the recommendations and building a, a greater rapport between the playing group and athletes and the governing body because the way the organisation structured is we have an administration that's based in Jollymont, three doors down from Cricket Australia, and we've got... 15 to 20 staff based in WA and 49 athletes because wow. they've got a centralised program. Mm. So it was trying to build that rapport. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad three months on, uh, just spent a week in Perth and, and there's a renewed sense of optimism within the playing group. Um, we'll announce a new, another new commercial deal. So that means we'll, we'll see a 25% increase in, in commercial revenue in three months. Fantastic. Nice. And the stakeholder management, I mean, it's an ongoing, it's an yeah. ongoing one. Mm. So um, it's just about, a, you know, picking up the phone and speaking as much as you can. Mm. That, that initial presentation you did in your interview, has that changed since you, since you did that? Like, have you, obviously you're seeing things and you're wanting to adapt and all that. How much has that changed from what you presented to them? Uh, not a lot. Not a lot. I think it's, it's, it's really important to be authentic. Because that's how you build the rapport and that's how you build the trust and respect. I think as a CEO, the two most key areas to build is trust and respect. So that the first opportunity you have to do that is your presentation. So you need to back back that up. Mm. Um, I, I suppose it's the same with every role, trust and respect. Do what you say you're going to do. Yeah. Yep. How do you come up with that plan if you're outside of that organisation? Like how do you know what's happening inside the tent yeah, if good... you're not inside the tent? Yeah. <laughs> There's always people to speak to. That's one, right? So you get some guidance there. Yeah. Um, do your research. It's the same with every job, whether it's in sport or not. When mm. you're going for a job, do your research. There's nothing worse than than coming mm. unprepared. It's a bit like an exam. If you're underprepared, you're not going to do well. You're mm. not confident. But if you've done the work and you'll always find the information on the website, always, especially in NSIs, you'll get an annual report, you'll get um, governance policies, You'll get the board, do your research on the board, um, stalk LinkedIn on as well. You're always going to get the level of information. You're never going to be 100% correct because you're not inside the 10, mm. but you can get you can be more you can be greater than 75%. Mm. What did you study at university, by the way? Economics and finance. Okay. It's a very dry, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was fortunate. I um, I studied a semester in in Denmark in Aarhus and um, played cricket overseas for two years. So I, I sort of got European that European cricket league? And no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've seen those YouTube videos. Yeah, um, yeah played in the UK and, and came back and I got that out of my system. Yeah. Yep. I always wanted to join sport. Um, I was fortunate. Um, I did some non-paid work, so volunteer work. Um, family friend of ours uh, was coaching the Western Jets in the TAC Cup at the time, what it was called. So I held his, I held, I held the match-ups board. Oh, nice. Lovely. So <laughs> it, was a, it was a great 
coaching. So Merv, Merv Kane, who's team and championship at Richmond, um, he's assistant coach with Liam Pickering, who's now a player manager. Dean Wallace, who was in his last year at Essendon. Wow. And a guy, Robbie McGee, who I didn't know, but apparently he was an enforcer, so to speak, mm. at Richmond. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I did that and then um, and then Merv ended up working with Adrian Dodoro at Essendon. So I, mm. I worked sort of on a volunteer capacity um, at Essendon for four years in recruiting. First two years was, was TAC Cup. My third year was VFL and then... My last year was VFL as well as holding the match-ups board for Shannon Grant, which is nice. interesting <laughs> in the coach's box. So that was that was a bit of fun. Awesome. Nice. Um, what, what do you for people who are listening to this thinking, I'd love to be a CEO of an NSO one day? What, what do you think the you know the stock standard university degree is to get to that point, or well, is there one? Oh, it's a really good question. I think having having a basis of of management and business does help. But primarily, you're going to you're going to learn from real life experience. It's important to get that degree because it's the first step. But for me, it was all about the experience that I could glean over over a period of time. And I think that's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a downside at the moment that people want to get somewhere in a real big hurry without the necessary experience. I was going to I gave myself five years to be commercial when I joined Sport. I gave myself five years to be a commercial director and 10 years to be a CEO. If I knew I wasn't on the track, I was going to go back. Mm. Right? So I always had clear some goals. And I got there, I got to a CEO in five years. So I jumped around a little bit. Mm. It's interesting that I spent in my first role 14 months, in my second role 14 months. But I, but I knew I, got, I hit my budgets every time, but I just wanted to get that experience. Mm. And I got some advice, not advice, but I, I, yeah, I did. I got some really good advice when I was in my when I was in my second role at, at the City Football Group, Melbourne City, from someone that I'd worked with at cricket, and he said, "Your next step has got to be out of sales. You've got to see yourself more than just a salesperson." And so, when the role came up at the PGA, and that was looking after broadcast, sponsorship, merchandise, licensing, ticketing, new events, and government, I jumped at it. That was the mm. best bit of advice. And as soon as I got the hockey job, I gave him a call and said, "Mate, that advice you gave me has stood me in good stead." Yeah. And so. All I'm saying is I, I feel the most comfortable coming into this role because I know I've had the experience in the past and I've, you know, there's always going to be knockbacks and setbacks. And as I say to my staff now, don't be afraid to make mistakes because it's, yeah. it, it's the main reason or it's the main way to learn. You learn from your mistakes. I make mistakes, but I know it's a great learning curve. And so that's, that's held me in good stead. Mm. I love how you sort of had, you gave yourself – <clears throat> Sorry, the, the five years, the ten years, and no matter what was happening, you're always going to go to that goal. So, <clears throat> sorry, my voice is a bit weird today. <laughs> uh, so you'd always shift roles if you need to. Like you saw that I'm not getting what I need here. I need to move. And I think that is something that people can get very not scared of, but you know they don't want to leave a role in a great organisation because it's such a great organisation, but they don't realise that's what they need to do. So. Mm. What's some advice for some people maybe early on in their career where they think this organisation's probably where I, where I want to be in 10 years but I'm not learning what I need to right now? Like how do they come to that decision? I'll, turn, I'll flip that on its head a little bit. Take, the, take a role for the job and what it can give you rather than just the organisation. Oh, it's it's yeah. obviously important to work for a good organisation but if I use an example, and this is nothing against AFL clubs, but obviously living in Melbourne, everyone loves AFL. If there's a job in an AFL club or there's a job somewhere else at a lower profile NSO, have a look at that job at the NSO because ultimately you're going to get a broader range of skills in a shorter space of time and you can always get to that AFL if you, if you, if you want to get there. So actually have a look at the job. So I remember um, and changing jobs. One of the hardest things I had to do was resign to my CEO at the PGA. I'm still friends with Gav to this day, great guy. It was, and I wasn't necessarily a golfer. I'm not really a golfer. I mean, if you saw me on the golf course, you'd realise that. But um, <laughs> I was actually going to ask you what what you hit off on no, a golf course. Terrible. But that's a good idea. <laughs> terrible. <laughs> um, one of the hardest decisions because I love that job, and it propelled me so far in my career. And Gav had given me so much scope, but ultimately I had to leave because it was a step up, and it was hitting the CEO position I've always wanted. Mm. And then people said to me, mate, why are you leaving golf to go to softball, for instance? It's like, mate, 
I can I can make a difference. I can make a difference. Yeah. Three and a half years later, I'm, I'm, I'm hockey and never in my wildest dreams did I think in less than 10 years I'd be hockey, hockey Australia CEO. But that's the advice I would give is look at the job and the difference that you can make because it's all a stepping stone of what you can put on your CV for your next job. Mm-hmm. Was that always what you thought about from your first job to this one now? Can I make a difference? Yeah. Because I think you, you're dead right there. You know, you could go to the biggest organisation or one that's a lot smaller, but I think we all know that at the smaller one, you can have much more of a difference. So it's, it's quite, it's, it's really great that you realise that from the get-go and not, you know, down the track. I think a lot of people just go for mm. the shiny lights of yeah. the organisation. And, and we've seen a couple of examples of people who have done that at an entry level. For example, uh, Eliza Dewar, um, we had her on, I think she's episode number 12, but she started her career at Gymnastics Victoria and she came straight out of uni and was the only marketing person at the organisation. So she was doing a bit of everything. But as you say, that gave her the scope to develop the skills to then get her the job at the Carlton Football Club. So I'm glad you mentioned you know AFL clubs mm. as an example. Uh, similarly, uh, our good friend, uh, Jack Lloyd, who uh, did an internship with us back in the day, he got his first job at Rugby Victoria and same sort of thing, was the marketing communications coordinator there, only person in his department, used that experience doing everything to get a job as a digital marketing coordinator at the T20 World Cup. And both of these people have been much better placed because of the smaller scale um, experience. And it's really cool to see that that doesn't just happen at an entry level, it happens you know, at an exec level as well. The other thing I want to comment on as well was that it sounds like you're very real with yourself that you know, if I'm not at this point after five years, it's time to change. Like, mm. Don't just keep hoping that something's going to click eventually. It's going to be up to me. And if I haven't got it by this point, then I've got to give myself a reality check and go back to what I know. It's true. I mean, it's... it's um I remember when I was at Melbourne City and, and I'd worked closely and had a coffee with Clint Bolton. Clint um, was a Soccer East goalkeeper and, and was a goalkeeper at Sydney at Melbourne City as well. Mm. And he's now a commentator. And he said, he had a good point. He said, it's a career. So there's a lot of people who work in sport, let's say Melbourne City or an AFL club that are there because they love the club. They're a supporter. But you've yeah. got to realise it's a job. And you've got to feed a family or you, you know, pay your rent or your mortgage. So at the end of the day, it's a career. And, and looking at that smaller sport, two of my career highlights have been in softball, without a shadow of a doubt. So within three months, um, created a new format of the sport, T20, commercialised it with mates at Fox. Literally the first night, live on Fox. We've got new sponsors, fireworks going. And it's like, how good is this? Like, awesome. Like, create and they will come and mm. and then the other one of we turned over the high performance team in uh, in Oct- uh, October to 2018 and then I was standing on the diamond in it was a grand final day September 2019 in, in Shanghai and we qualify for the Olympics I'm on the phone to my high performance director in tears going oh my like it is the most <laughs> unbelievable feeling plus I think I was in tears because it, it ended up being worth you know three million dollars to us yeah. <laughs> um, KPI's hit yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but just two of the most incredible incredible highs I've ever had oh, that's awesome pretty cool um you mentioned like all these different time points you know you've got your five year goals it sounds like you've been very thorough in your career planning I wanted to touch on time management because a lot of our students have time management issues they're trying to juggle study with work experience with casual jobs with a social life with playing sport on the weekend or whatever what's your approach to time management it's a really good question (laughs) we brought it up in our staff meeting yesterday actually (laughs) a lack of you're well (laughs) equipped to answer this it's um it comes down to a philosophy i use as well which is outcome versus results so it's a bit like when I say to the staff, if you are sitting in, and everyone gets like this, I get like this. If you're sitting in front of your computer and what you're doing is not directly correlated to, to hitting your KPIs, go for a walk, get a coffee, get outside for some fresh air, come back, reset. And I think that's where you've got to really be, um, really be settled. You've got to have a good diary. <laughs> you've got to put everything in your diary. That's what my wife's good for as well. <laughs> so, right, yeah. But um, physical diary or phone diary? Phone diary, <laughs> yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. Um, 
it's just a matter of hitting your goals and what's going to hit your goals, put in your diary and be settled with it. Like time management as a CEO is not great, but I still have time to get, you know, as I said before, to, to coach up my little under 10s on a Friday night and, and yeah. just block some time in your diary for that. Hmm. I think it's important to have a mix, especially social. Do you set especially. yourself like boundaries? It's one thing I I've, like have kind of looked at the last few years just from talking to different people. It's around, you know, setting those times and sticking to it and not giving in to, oh, yeah, I, I could do a meeting then. Like, no, like that's not the time for a meeting. Like that's what I'm going to do what I need to do. Is I'm that- not great at that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll admit I'm not great at that. I'm, yeah. a, you know. Except if it's Friday night. Yeah. Coach the, uh, coach yes, the yes, exactly right. <laughs> um, it's very difficult because it's such a fast-moving world at the moment and there's so much going on. As a CEO, it's a little bit different. I haven't found that sort of decent mix yet. I think what's made it easier, if I'm going to be honest, a positive has been the flexible working environment and we will continue that for as long as I'm CEO, like flexible working environments. Mm. That's your kind of organisation you want to work at. So having the ability to work from home and now it's school holiday, so, you know, having lunch with the kids is great. Or, you know, sometimes I'll work from a cafe. One of my favourite cafes, I'll just work from there if I don't have any meeting because at least it's a different environment mm, yeah. and it's something different. So I think that's what that does help Yeah, in regards to that. But mm. time management's always an issue for me, I know that. Mm. I, don't have, I don't have a lot of great advice. <laughs> <laughs> well, one interesting thing you said is do only do the things that are directly correlated to your goals. So it sounds like it's very much dependent on having a goal in mind. I don't know when I was a student, I just kind of rocked up to university and, you know, occasionally went to class, <laughs> um, but just kind of was there to get through university without too much of a goal. And But would then struggle to, you know, balance going to footy training or working a job at the same time. But it sounds like an easy fix is perhaps setting a goal during uni so that then you can anchor your time around that. Makes your job, makes your first job a little bit easier because when you join the workforce, you're going to have KPIs. Mm. So at hockey, we have, and, and this was helped set by the staff, we've got our top 11, 11 players on, mm. on a hockey team. So our 11 KPIs. And they're, one of the one of the changes we've made is they're on the screensaver, they're on the backdrop of everyone's laptop, just in case, right? Yeah. So you might as well get into practice when you're at uni mm. around setting your KPIs. Because you know when you get your first job, you're going to have them, whether you like it or not. That's a really good point. So set your life KPIs there. What do you want to get out of the of the year? And and one thing I made a you know a point of doing was having a one on one with every staff member when I joined. Mm. And one of my questions I asked them personal questions, but one the, the one work question I did ask is, what do you want to get out of this year? So if we're sitting here two days before Christmas, what do you want to be hanging your hat on? Mm. Yeah. And that's it's, the advice I would give is two days before Christmas, what do you want to be hanging your hat on for the year? Mm. For students who might be struggling to come up with something, if you were a student in your last year of university now, what, what are three KPIs you might set for yourself? Work experience, work experience, work experience. <laughs> because yeah. when you you know, when you leave uni, just have a think about how many other people are gonna be in your position. There's going to be a lot. So what's going to set you above other people when you're going for your first job? It's yeah. the work experience. Mm. No one's ever asked me for my academic transcript. Neither. I Never would've. provided a uni <laughs> transcript. I, I could have not gone to uni. Yeah. <laughs> I could have just said I did, yeah, which is crazy. Mm. I'm, I mean, I'm glad I did, obviously, and yeah. I, I did go to uni, everybody. But, like, <laughs> it, it, it is a funny thing. It's like you just, if you – like. Experience trumps all of that. And attitude. Yeah. Mm. So one thing we do look for is attitude. And when you're coming in and roll your sleeves up, be a sponge and get it done, mm. that'll really set you apart from other people. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. It comes back to when people put passion in the first line of their <laughs> cover letter. <laughs> Don't write it, show it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Love it. Um, a CEO is quite a public-facing role. Um, and I, you know, looking back at your um, your history and where you've been, a lot of those roles you wouldn't have been in front of a camera or 
wouldn't have come on the the uh, sports go podcast or <laughs> <laughs> channel 10 all those kind of things how have you dealt with that transition does that come naturally or did, did it take a bit of time for you to get used to actually having to uh, get on tv and, and speak to millions of people um i was fortunate in golf it was more of a public facing yep. um and that's where it comes from learning from your mistakes one of the best people laugh at this actually but my uni job helped me a lot about speaking to people which was I worked at Crazy John's, which is not no longer around, but you were selling mobile phones. Yeah. So at the age of 18, mm. I'm selling mobile phones and trying to do a, a deal and contracts and stuff. So that made it a lot easier. Um, you just learn from your mistakes. You know, yeah. there's um, – you, you learn something. And, and I've been fortunate. So at Softball, we, I had a board member who was a former journalist. So I sat down with him after my first interview when I was CEO there and said, critique me, mm. which was great. And it was, and you can see in politicians when they speak, there's a lot of pauses, like pregnant pauses, and they talk like this, so they don't stumble over their words. It's yep. the best bit of advice I ever got. Um, and it's just repetition. It's like the same with anything. It's like kicking a football. Mm. You're gonna get better if you practice. It's a bit mm. like Steph Curry. Mm. Why do you think Steph Curry? It's no fluke. He's one of the best shooters ever. It's because he trains and practices and practices and practices. Yeah, that's what it is. Mm. Yeah. You mentioned learning from your mistakes. Was there one particular stuff <laughs> yeah. up in the early days on air? <laughs> um, oh, not that I can, not that I can remove, not that I'm making <laughs> bloopers real. Nothing major. Sure. <laughs> um, no, not really. I mean, I, I had a little bit of a quirky one last year, as I was saying to you before, that um, with softball, we were the first team of any sport or any country to get to, um, to get to Tokyo. So we were, you sort of used as a little bit of a guinea pig and I was interviewed live on BBC International TV and, I got the question from the journalist about, you know, what we had to be, you know, what the team was doing. And he goes, well, why aren't you there? <laughs> <laughs> so this is live and I'm sitting there and I've gone, I'm just going to answer this naturally. So I said, well, I can't hit a home run, can I? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure that's a blooper. That was a little, being a little bit smarter. But, um, <laughs> but uh, that's probably the only thing. I'll probably, if I had my time over again, I wouldn't have said that. But uh, <laughs> I thought I'd be authentic. <laughs> I'm sure plenty of people in the UK would have enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. Speaking from the heart. I yeah. Like it. Awesome. Tell us about the um uh the upcoming com games in, in Birmingham and also the future one that's coming to Victoria in twenty twenty six. Um what what is hockey doing to prepare for each of those? Yeah, so it's a really interesting one because obviously we've got the hockey roos and the kookaburras and they're at very different stages of the life cycle, if I could say that even though the Kookaburras are ranked one and, and the Hockey Roos have gone from fourth in the world to second in the world and haven't played a game. So the Kookaburras just need games. So um, we play a five-test match series against Malaysia in Perth starting next week. And then we've, uh, we're going, both teams are going to New Zealand and then the, the Kookaburras are going on to Spain and Netherlands to play some practice matches before Commonwealth Games. Great history in winning gold and that's what they're aiming to do. Hockey Roos, on the other hand, We've had five retirees and gone through that cultural review piece. So the squad of 22 has been picked with an eye to Paris in two years because it's only two years to the next yeah. Olympic Games. There's a World Cup. So we play in Spain and the Netherlands prior to a Com Games and then go to the Com Games. So for, for this, it's a, it's a lot about experience too. Um, so that's where they're obviously different life cycles. We have Pro League, which starts again in January next year that goes to the middle of next year and then suddenly we're 12 months out from the Paris Olympics. So, as I said, different life cycles. Um, it's really exciting to have a Com Games in Victoria because now what we want to do is leverage it to participation. So I used the example on TV the other day that the under-18 national championships has just finished, as have the under-15s. How great that is to be able to play in a sport where – you come through the pathway and if you're good enough, you get to represent your country in a home com games and home Olympics. Mm. Yeah. It's yeah. awesome. So good. And we've got the opportunity to bid for a men or women's World Cup in 26, which we will do. Um, we've just got to decide where it's going to be and if it's men or women, and then we obviously got to be successful. But it's a, it's a great runway. Um, I'm on the committee, one of seven people, um, for a joint um, submission to government, and this is run by the AOC and CGA, so the Olympics and, and Commonwealth Games in regards to the funding model. Yeah. And the 10 plus 10 means 10 years leading into Brisbane and the legacy that it leaves after Brisbane, which is really important. Yeah. A federal election will hopefully help that um, <laughs> this year. But, 
you know, we need to look at the way we fund sports and whether it's a top-down approach of putting the money into high performance. If we're successful, we know at high performance level, you know, that's where we need to feed it down through participation. So, yeah, there's a lot of work to do, but it's really exciting. It's a really exciting time to be part of Australian sport, specifically NSO land and Olympic mm. and Com Games sports because it's such a great runway. Mm. I'm going to borrow your own question. When we get to 2026, what would you like to be able to hang your hat on? Yeah, I, I, for me, it's about – it's numerous things. It's having more um, non-government revenue into the sport. It's about the legacy I want to leave – is increased participation. We've got a great, we've got not over 93,000 people signed up in the database playing. But if we can increase that, what that does is it increases the pool that then can go through the pathway. And the AIS talk about the pathway the whole time. So that is going from grassroots through to state team, through to underage national teams, through to Kookaburra's Hockey Roos. So the more people we have participating in our sport, the greater opportunity we have to get more athletes through the pathway at a higher level into Hockey Roos and Kookaburras. And then ultimately, after Com Games 26, it leaves that legacy of increased participation with six years on, uh, with a runway of six years to a mm. home Olympic Games in Brisbane. Yeah. And I want to see two gold medals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, How, um, no pressure to the teams. No, yeah. <laughs> no none whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How do you – like? Hockey, we've had so much success. Like we've been elite in hockey for so long. And you mentioned there, you know, ninety three thousand people playing, which is awesome. You'd obviously want that to be two hundred thousand. So how do you how do you increase that when we're already doing so well? Like, what else can we do to keep pushing yeah. that so that more people are playing? So we've got ninety three thousand members. We we think there's about two hundred fifty thousand participants. Gotcha. It's really hard to measure participants because yeah. there's no way to measure it. But um, yeah, it's a really good question and one that it's actually I'm presenting to my board in regards to a strategy and that what I want as part of my strategy is that we have two of the most iconic brands in Australian sport, and I can say that confidently because. I was one of these people that every four years was a hockey supporter. It's a bit like when you get to Spring Racing Carnival, everyone's got a tip. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's got a tip. You yeah. know, you've got to put it on this horse. Every four years, everyone's a hockey expert, as they yeah. are with swimming and athletics. And um, Just so, get a goal. Come on. Yeah, correct. <laughs> correct. <laughs> correct. I mean, the drag flicks and the – Yeah. <laughs> oh, you should have saved that. I would yeah, have saved that. Yeah, going on? <laughs> um, so what I want is more content – in Australia for the Hockey Roos and Kookaburras and then ultimately the refresh of our Hockey One League, which has only been played once. So yeah. we need to relaunch that, which we will at the end of this year. So if we have more Hockey Roos, Kookaburras and Hockey One content, then... When you say content, you mean broadcast on TV? No, content as in games. Games, okay. Then we can feed off high-performance yeah. outcomes because it's better to play than train, as we all know. We're going to get more destinational fund support from state governments to play around the country more PR, more marketing, comms, more events, which will lead to greater revenue, more sponsorship assets, which will, which will hopefully lead to more non-government revenue. And ultimately, we can leverage the participation because we know if your high-end athletes are participating in Australia more often, we can leverage it and get, the, you know, and I can go to the, to the MA or the state CEOs and say, fill these grandstands with kids. We'll put on clinics. We'll do signings. And that's what we can do. And that's yeah. that's the strategy that awesome. that we want to get in place. And that's why home Commonwealth Games, Olympic Games is so important. Yeah. Mm. Wow. That's awesome. It's a, it's a very exciting runway. Oh, it I mean, is. Yeah. For, it, not just for hockey, just yeah, for, yeah. for a lot of sports, you know. Um, you know, colleague Eugenie, who's CEO of swimming, I mean, swimming is so popular. But now having that, you know, home com games and, and, and home Olympics to look forward to. And I think mm. it's great, I will say, I'm not getting political here, but by the Victorian government and taking the Commonwealth Games to regional areas because, mm. it, you know, it, it takes sports to people who may not necessarily have gone, but also it helps with infrastructure because that's another yeah. massive issue in Australian sport. Is not everyone has a hockey turf. Correct. Yeah. And it's that that can what lead to a, to a legacy. So, mm. um Watch out for people at Geelong and, and hopefully, <laughs> I mean, that, that 
that'll open up conversations that I can have mm, yeah. about bringing more content to Geelong in the lead up to Com Games as well. Mm. How do you work with the the other national bodies who are Olympic sports and Commonwealth Games sports to I don't know, bounce ideas off each other or collaborate and do different things? It's one of the advantages of COVID and people being online is that you can interact uh, more often. Everyone's really busy, so it's really hard to do that. But um, the AIS, Sport Australia, every quarter have a CEO's catch-up. AOC, we're really, we probably caught up as CEOs of, of um, Olympic sports every every month through COVID. So you have that relationship now where, um, I'll use an example. So national champs are, are on at the moment with a lot of sports and COVID policies and, you know, within 10 minutes you can get an answer from five different sports on what they're doing. Mm. And there's a real collegiate nature, which is fantastic. We're not against each other. We're not competing against each other. But um, there's a great rapport that's been built intrinsically and there's actually two sort of groups who meet outside of sort of the governing bodies. Um, the Dirty Dozen, which is swimming, hockey, <laughs> gymnastics, basketball, athletics, and then... Um, Softball, baseball, water polo on the other sort of side. So, mm. The yeah, dirty doesn't. Never heard of that. <laughs> you can blame Ian Robson for that, I reckon. <laughs> <laughs> if Robbo's listening, um, that's all you, mate. The dirty doesn't. <laughs> don't mind it. That's awesome. Well, we're like, we're like, I don't know. We're certainly not privy. I'm sure like, you know, the general population isn't privy to what goes on at that exact level. Nor would you sport. want to sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I'm sure. laughs> so it's really interesting to say, to hear how you interact and how it all kind of comes together in, in Australia, yeah, we we usually get guest speakers as well. Um, it helps that one of the dirty dozen, which was Kitty Chiller, who's now moved from CEO of gymnastics into National Sports Tribunal, um, came in and, and spoke to the group last time. That is an area we speak a lot about: is governance. Mm. A lot of our job is on governance at the moment, mm. a lot. So um, that takes up a lot of conversation, as does funding matters, because mm. we all want more funding. Yeah, um, <laughs> can tell that's that'd just, be a good conversation. That's um. That's always a bone of contention, but it's always going to be. It doesn't mm. matter how much you get. You always want more. So, mm. um, yeah. Awesome. Kitty Chiller was actually one of the uh, very first guests on the YouTube series of Sports Grad way back in, in 2017. So uh, I ran into her at the World Uni Games in Taipei, and I saw that Kitty was there, and I thought, what a great opportunity to interview Kitty. So we uh, we went to the, watch the tennis one day, and I uh, brought along the camera, had my questions prepared, and we sat down to do the interview, and it was just blowing a gale. There were planes <laughs> flying overhead, and uh, poor Kitty was sitting there while this, you know, uni student was trying to fire away a few <laughs> questions to her about <laughs> what it meant to be, um, you know, an athlete in 2000 and be uh, the chef de mission in 2016. She did a great job, of course, but I'm sure she was like, oh, I've got much better ways to spend my time <laughs> than doing she's, this. She's fantastic. I've always, you know, as a younger CEO, I always tapped into her knowledge too. She wouldn't have mind. She's she's great. She's mm. fantastic, a real asset. Which unfortunately, I mean, she's not lost to Australian sport because she's still in the NST, but and she's still got really strong contacts with the AOC. But uh, yeah, we lost a good one there in CEO land for sure. <laughs> mm. Mm. Awesome. Um, it's good to have hockey part of the sports great community. By the way, we're exact. We're pumped. Yeah, it's great to be part of it. I mean, I, full credit to you guys. Not to pump up your tyres too much. But, um, <laughs> I wasn't looking for pumping up the tyres for no, that question. It's, uh, it's great. It's great that what you're doing, and I like to support people having a crack. Really, um, that's what I say to my staff. You know, it's better better to have a crack and make a mistake. Not saying you made a mistake, um, and learn <laughs> from it. Then they'll come. Then, yeah. um, then not have a crack at all. It's about innovation, and um, what you're providing is something that hasn't been provided before. And as I said off, you know, before this podcast, that um, as an employer of of people. You know, there's a lot of time wasted in going with Seek and 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 LinkedIn and 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 a few others. Whereas, if I know that we can put roles through you guys, it's an engaged um, network, which is great, and and it also a way for our younger staff to engage with other people and um, sell the merits of of such a good sport like hockey. Brilliant. Well, I think. Uh well, with you and the community, you guys can just sell it for us. That was perfectly put. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, passionate. I'm passionate about it, I must admit. <laughs> I, um, when I was looking to get into sport, I put together a spreadsheet mm. and um, I put together 
all of these contacts and, and I just spoke to people because I know how hard it is to get in. But once you're in, you're in and you can move pretty quickly. But mm. um, I've got a few stories on that. I'll, I won't wax lyrical today, <laughs> but um, it, a conversation is never a waste of time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, no, it's great to have you, the hockey uh, Hockey Australia staff represented in there and good to see some roles coming through and hopefully – few more members can jump on a few of those jobs coming up. That'd be great. Mm, more awesome. the merrier. David, it has been awesome chatting to you. I think you're the first NSO CEO we've spoken to, which is incredible. So we really appreciate your time and just hearing your vast experience and some of the lessons you've learned uh, are genuinely so useful for our listeners. So we really appreciate your time again. No, I appreciate it. And um, as I said, always, always learn from your mistakes and I always learn on a daily basis. Um, so good luck to everyone and happy to have a chat too. Like my details are pretty public, so I'm pretty passionate about helping too. So um, appreciate it. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All righty, Rubes. Wow. Great episode. Good to have David in the studio. Mm. It's really good. First CEO NSO we've had on the show, as I mentioned at the start of the episode. Uh, it certainly lived up to the bill. Absolutely, absolutely. He had some incredible uh, words of wisdom, some very practical pieces of, of advice and some great stories and examples from his own journey as well that are extremely applicable. Mm. I think the first one that I picked up on was he knew that he didn't have sport experience when he made the jump into cricket, but he knew he had to stand in some way, shape or form. So he really had to paint the picture of how his skills in investment banking were transferable to Cricket Victoria. Yep. So what he's done, he's gone out of his own way and put it all into a nice little PowerPoint deck yeah. <laughs> and then presented that alongside his resume to say, I know I'm not from sport, but please consider me because this is what I've learned in investment yep. banking and this is how it correlates to what you need in sport. Yeah, I love that. It's kind of a blueprint, I think, for what it's going to turn into. It's like I, f I feel like that was awesome, actually submitting a presentation. Yeah. You know? Great stuff. Um, I loved how he, he basically looked at every role that he, he wanted to get and he thought, can I make a difference to it? And he said some really great points around like when you're choosing a job, where can you make the most difference? And, you know, it might not be, you know, the biggest footy club in the land. It might be, you know, a, a relatively smaller sport. But if you know that you can go into a role where you can really make a difference and have an impact, then go to that smaller opportunity because that's what's going to allow you to oh the other thing i loved how he said you can make mistakes yeah i think you know part of that is like it. you can learn in these smaller roles you can make mistakes in there and try and you know do the best you can but that's where you're going to learn so mm. that's going to set you up to eventually get to that point it's a marathon not a sprint <laughs> the other point that i really loved was um around setting yourself kpis before you get to your job because you're going to get KPIs mm. when you arrive at your job. You might as well start working towards KPIs now. Yeah. And he gave some really good examples about what students should be looking for. All around experience, set your KPIs around just getting as much work experiences as possible. Yeah. But then he also really, he touched on how um, it really helps with time management. Because, because if you've got a goal and you've got a KPI, mm. then as David says, every single thing that you do in your day should be leading towards that goal. And if yep. it's not, go for a walk, grab some water, come back, reset, yeah. and then focus on the next thing that's going to take you towards that goal. Yeah, I did love that. It was awesome. Mm. All righty, well, what an episode. Good to get David in, good to chat, and a great part of the sports Grad community, which is, you know, we're, we're stoked to have Hockey Australia involved. So good on them. Thanks for listening. Uh, you can find us on LinkedIn, plus be sure to jump into the community, as I just mentioned. Uh, we'd love to chat with you on there. So head to our website to join or head to our link in the show notes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.